Good morning. Today we're looking at a passage in Luke 157 to 80. And it is essentially about the faithfulness of God. Joshua, the leader after Moses, who led the people into the promised land and then celebrates all of what God has done, writes in Joshua 21, 45, not one of the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. For as many as are the promises of God, Paul writes, the Corinthians, in him, in Christ, they are yes. And the writer of the Hebrews writes, he who promised is faithful. And God is a God of grace who delights in being gracious to broken, fallible people like you and me. He finds joy in giving his people the blessings that they do not deserve and withholding the chastisement, the punishment, the consequences that they do deserve. He has, according to Ephesians 1, 9, kind intentions toward us who are not under the law, but are under grace. And he will pour out his surpassing riches of his grace for all eternity, Ephesians 2, 7. Today we're looking at a spirit-inspired song from an unlikely source, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, who didn't believe when he, the angel spoke to him about what was going to happen. Because of his lack of faith, he was silenced for nine months and then restored. This is going to look at the extraordinary circumstances that inspired Zechariah to testify and to be used as a spokesman for God in this song. Zechariah and Elizabeth were insistent that they were going to name their child John, as the angel Gabriel had told them, and not as with the name of some member of their family. Zechariah's restoration of speech after nine months illustrates an amazing occurrence. And he breaks out in song and he describes his son's role as the forerunner of God's salvation. He prepares the people for the true dawn, the rising sun that is coming. Luke 1, 57 to 80. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs 
to his father to find out what he would like the name of the child to be. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servants, David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. The setting here is a family gathering. Two old people in their 70s or 80s are having a child. And that's enough to draw a crowd, even in the ancient world. And everybody gathered to celebrate. See, circumcision was something that they did on the eighth day. They did this for males. This goes back to Genesis. In chapter 15 of Genesis, God received, gave grace to Abraham because he had believed. And then he was circumcised as a sign of that internal work in his heart. This was instituted by God. There are health benefits to this. And it was a symbol of the nationality. It prevented disease. And circumcising on the eighth day, we didn't know anything about, but babies don't have the ability to clot. Their blood can, will not clot until the seventh or eighth day. Vitamin K is given to birth babies today, but in the ancient world, you had to wait until their ability to stop the bleeding became part of their natural bodies. It was a sign of the covenant. 
it was a sign of their nationality. It was a time of celebration. And in this particular time, it was a time for naming the child. Someone else here is doing the circumcision. Typically, it would be the father. But if, you have a, if you're old and you have a shaky hand, you don't want to do something like that. So they have somebody else coming to do it. Maybe it's a rabbi, uh, a, a community leader. Moses' son was circumcised by Sephora. And... Uh, Naming of a child was significant in the ancient world. It's often very significant in the modern world, but it's not so evident in the name itself. It's something about the name that makes it interesting. But in the ancient world, say, for example, Jacob and Esau. Esau means hairy. This little kid was born and he was hairy. So that's what they named him. He was Prince Harry. And Jacob was named because he was the one who grabbed the heel of Harry as he was coming out, these twins. See, in the ancient world, it meant something. Like Elijah means Yahweh is God. Saul and Samuel mean asked for. But in this case, John. Yohan, Yohanan is the Hebrew word, the Hebrew name. God is and has been gracious And that's what the angel told Zechariah as he was in the Holy of Holies that they was going to name the child. The language of this prophecy, of this song, this expression of faith through the Holy Spirit has echoes of the Magnificat. It has echoes of songs throughout the Old Testament. It starts off with, he is called John. And they made signs. And it suggests that not only was Zacharias, Zechariah had become mute, dumb, unable to speak, but he was also unable to hear. So they asked for a writing tablet. And this wasn't something that you go and get at the drugstore that's in a ring notebook with sheets and a, a pen. Now, in the ancient world, first century, a writing tablet was a piece of wood with an indentation into the surface. And you'd pour wax over the surface of the wood and you'd use a stylus to mark in the wax, and that's what he did. See, if you're unable to speak for nine months, this was something that they did often. You could, after you write on it, you could put it near the fire, the wax would melt, and you reuse it. He was unable to speak for nine months. And all of a sudden, he begins to speak. His lips are freed up and he praises God. This is called the Benedictus. That's the first opening word in the Latin translation, just like Magnificat was the first word in the Latin translation 
of the Bible by Jerome. This is the same thing is here. This is, they just picked that word and made that the title of this hymn. And this is something that set the world around them into awe. Someone who was unable to speak for nine months, all of a sudden speaks and sings and talks and speaks clearly with meaning. This was something that God had been doing. And Zacharias had his own seclusion and the ancient world, women, especially Elizabeth, because she had been pregnant so many times and it had failed. She secluded herself. But in this case, Zechariah had been secluded for nine months, unable to communicate. And he's obviously been thinking and reflecting on his response in the Holy of Holies. And he points to Isaiah 40, verse 3. And that text says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. See, Isaiah is prophesying that there will be a prophet and he will come and prepare the way for God. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And that's what this song is about. And people were talking about the, these things. That he has come to his people. And he's preparing a horn of salvation. This is recorded, this language is used in Psalms 18.2. See, a, a, an ox horn was a symbol of power and strength in the modern world as well as in the ancient world. In the house of his servant David, See, they belonged to the priestly tribe of Levi, but they knew that salvation is to come through their son, but through Jesus, who had a Davidic descendant, who was a Davidic descendant. And uh, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of the Old Testament. The oath he swore to our father Abraham. See, God swore an oath to Abraham that he was going to fulfill the promises of the covenant of Abraham, which included protecting Israel and being a blessing to all the nations through Israel. We see this in Genesis 12, 3. We see this in Ge Genesis 22, 18. And he is going to be a prophet of the Most High. See, John's role was with that of Elijah, who was going to prepare the way for God's coming, to prepare the way for the Lord. Christians would later call Jesus the Lord. But in Zechariah's mind, he couldn't get his head around that. But he knew he was preparing the way for God's salvation. And the way he describes it in this song is that it is a rising sun. It's a bright light. It's a, a sun at at the morning dawn, I get up and drive to the gym when it's dark. And as I approach the exit to the gym, 
the light from the, the horizon blares in bl a blinding way. And that's what Jesus is being represented as, is the rising sun in this dark world. Jesus is going to be the rising sun for those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, verse 79. See, this is an echo of Isaiah as well. Isaiah 9 talks about a child born to reign on David's throne, and one of his many titles would be Mighty God. Isaiah 9, 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoiced when dividing the plunder. For in the day of Midian's defeat, you will scatter the yoke, shatter the yoke that burdens them and bar across their shoulders the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment roiled in blood will be destined for burning, it will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. See, he is announcing in this song, not just the birth of his son, John, but the purpose of this son, John. He was going to be announcing the dawn of light, the Messiah. And he is fulfilling his promises to Israel. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. See, this idea of covenant fulfillment is essential in the Old Testament, and it's fulfilled in Christ. At the Last Supper, he speaks of the new covenant. And Zechariah, in his song, links the coming work of salvation with God's promises those he made to Abraham and to David. God fulfills his promises. And this son of his was, is going to live in the wilderness. He's going to come out of the wilderness. And in Israeli history, the wilderness was significant. It was a time for the, those who were had turned against God to die off. And for the people who remained to focus on their purpose, they got to know God in the wilderness. He is always faithful in his covenant promises. 
Zacharias, he learned from his mistakes. He did not have faith. We saw that in earlier on in the Gospel of Luke. That's why he lost his speech. But through the pain of that reflection and discipline, he emerges a stronger man of God. Zacharias was a lot of things, but he wasn't arrogant. He knew his failure, and he was restored to God. That gives you and I hope. He's acting on behalf of his people to raise up a horn of salvation. He's promising that he is going to raise up the Messiah, a servant. He indicates that his own son will be a prophet of the Most High, preparing the people, telling them about the salvation through the forgiveness of sins, and he will go before the Lord. He will go before the Messiah. God's mercy is at work. He will send the rising sun, verse 79, the morning star. This alludes to Numbers 24, 17 and Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. This is a concept in the Old Testament. We can see it in Psalms 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? We see this in John. John tells the story of the incarnation at the beginning in chapter 1. And he speaks of light and darkness, just as this Benedictus this song of Zechariah. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And that's the significance of this song. <clears throat> Zacharias was not a sinless man. He repented. He changed his mind. He grew. And we learn from Zechariah that even good men and women can get better and learn to walk God in a, with God in a deeper way as we trust God through our ups and downs in life. It's how we respond to our failures. Zacharias didn't give up. He didn't become angry at God. He repented. He continued to love God. He is sending a forerunner to tell people about the forgiveness of sins. God is faithful and he forgave Zacharias. God is faithful and will forgive and work in us no matter 
how we stumble and fall. God always fulfills all of his promises to his people and to the world through the birth of this child who is the light of the world. This, these were some of the verses of the song. To give his people the knowledge of the salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Light is all God gives us. He doesn't coerce us to follow him. People naturally move to light. Flies move to light. People respond willingly to light. See, God doesn't coerce people to follow him. He draws them by the light of his love, by the hope of his Messiah. That is the Christmas message. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending light into this dark world. Lord, we pray that those who are in darkness would see the light and be drawn to it. And Lord, for those of us who stumble and fail, help us to know, as with Zechariah, that there is always hope. There is always forgiveness. God's love is faithful and generous. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. May we walk in your light. In Christ's name we pray, amen.